Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very spooky and horrific episode of Fat Mascara, a podcast about beauty culture hosted by me, Jen Sullivan, and my favorite co-host, Jessica Matlin, who will be here momentarily. So it's spooky. It's not spooky and horrific. It's just a little bit of a Halloween theme. It's Friday, so we have a fabulous and timely interview for you. We have special effects makeup artist Emily Schubert. She is the author of the book Beauty of the Beast, published by A24. But she's been a makeup artist, hairstylist, worked on numerous shorts and feature films, including The Sweet East, Good Time, and On Killer Robots. She also does makeup for documentaries and celebrity clients. She does special effects work for creative projects, including one you may have seen recently. Well, not that recently. You know that New York Magazine cover package about the ethics of pets? She was the artist who turned the models into pets, including a goldfish and a cat. Just please... Pause what you're doing before you even hear from her. Hit the link in the show notes so you can see that work. It honestly stopped me in my tracks. She's a genius. Anyway, she's lived 100 lives, including as a hand model, which we didn't even have time to talk about in this episode. But we did talk about special effects, makeup, horror films, some last-minute Halloween ideas. Honestly, we may have had a little too much fun with Emily, but I think that's just right for our Halloween episode of Fat Mascara. It's a little dark and a little spooky, but a lot of fun. Anyway, let's get into it. Welcome, Emily. Hello. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Fat Mascara. Thank you for coming. So, Emily, I know that you're live piped in from Brooklyn. That's right. I know that there's a target around the corner. I'm mm-hmm. trying to set you in a place. <laughs> trying to put you <laughs> in a place. But let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Where are you from? I'm from Riverdale, which is in the Bronx. That's at the oh, end. Oh, so you're, the you're end like of a local train. girl. You're like a local New York girl. I'm a local New York girl. That's right. Riverdale's lovely. Oh, yeah. Riverdale's beautiful. nice. Very beautiful place. Very green. It's unlike other places. That's living. Oh, yeah. She's a New Yorker through and through. And then you ended up in Brooklyn. I ended up in Brooklyn. Yeah, I've been here. I've been in my apartment for like 12 years. Okay. <laughs> Forever. Yeah. Give us a little bit about your journey. To living here for 12 years? Yeah. Yeah. Well- <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm really like I've like lost my I've lost my touch a little bit. I we had a little bit of a, a rattled setup, I've gotta say. I like <laughs> oh, <you did. laughs> I think it was my bad. It was on This me. isn't like Walter me. Cronkite <laughs> journalism here. I'm like, how'd you get from how'd you get from Riverdale to the Target? <laughs> Guys, we know about the Target because Emily is so lovely. She had to run out and buy headphones for us at the Target before we could start recording. We're here. No, well, let's, I just have let's, organization problems. We don't need a geography. Which is let's why get it's so ma- yeah. remarkable that I made a book. <laughs> well, let's back up. Let's back up a little bit. Did you know that you were going to stay? Did you know, like, I'm going to be, like, a woman in the arts. I am going to stay local in the city, and I am going Ooh. to, like, make my way here and find myself did you know you're going to stay in the city and be here? Or did you say like, okay, I got to get out. I think it's interesting that when people in the city, people stay in the city. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess I kept getting jobs here. I guess when I graduated college, I was doing makeup in college a lot and everyone moved to the city to move to New York City. So I was here and that's where well, my would you, Did you go to college here in the city? I went to college in Connecticut at Wesleyan. Okay. All right. Now, okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Now yeah, we're getting we, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, my husband went to Wesley, and I know about the Wesleyan type. Oh, my God. Artsy, artsy people. We're tight. We're tight in it. Okay, so you went to Wesleyan. All right. I did. And you were doing makeup, like, for fun or, like, actually as, like, a... Well, well, so I started doing makeup when I was 14 on set. That was when I first started working in movies, and I started doing special effects Who let you do that? So it really starts where I, well, I was always playing with makeup as a kid and my dad, he's an eye surgeon. And when he performs surgeries, he inserts a laparoscopic lens to the back of the eye. He films his surgeries. So we grew up without cable and that was kind of what was always on the TV were these eye surgeries. So I think it kind of blended the idea of like, yeah, what's real, what's fake, it's, it's medical. And Then I ended up getting a very intense reconstructive back surgery when I was 13. I had really bad scoliosis. 
and all the girls around me were getting boobs at that time. But I was like, one of my ribs was growing really big. I kind of like started looking like a monster. And then I had this surgery. I was out of school for a while and I started becoming pretty obsessed with special effects makeup. Like what is the body? This can't be who I am. If your body can betray you in this way, then this can't be it. You know, yeah. people come in and they're like, oh, you put this fake nose on me. But I'm like, what do you think your nose is? Like, that's not you, you know? So that was kind of, it kind of gave me that mindset. You were felt kind of divorced from, I don't want to say, like you, you felt like you could t look at people's bodies objectively, like you could have a separation. Yeah, the separation, right. Like the, the body to who you are, but also that beauty makeup can be so many things that beauty makeup and special effects maker are actually kind of the same thing. After the surgery, I lost a lot of blood. So my face was kind of gray. And I remember seeing that in the mirror and kind of thinking that beauty makeup is really just looking alive. It's really just looking healthy. So I would put blush on and I would say, okay, I look normal now. And I started thinking of blush very differently. And then when I got back into school, I started doing my friend's makeup to get to have them get out of tests and presentations. And I would do that too. So it just kind of showed me this other side of makeup, this more gruesome side, but this more... Wait, you'd make them look sick so they didn't have to do their tests? Yeah, like I would make... I remember that, yeah, this one time I had a physics pop quiz and I went into the bathroom and I, I learned about it like in the cafeteria. As you can tell, I'm a little bit of a last minute kind of person. So I, so I was in the cafeteria and they were like, Emily, we have a physics pop quiz. And I was like, what? And I went to the bathroom and I remember putting blush like around my nose and a little mascara. I like rubbed it in my, in my middle fingers and like put it underneath my eyes. And I kind of made myself look a, like a little tired. And I remember going up to the teacher and being like, I could take the test, but it wouldn't be my best. <laughs> <laughs> And then I remember like turning around and making eye contact with my friends who I was in the cafeteria with. And they were like, oh man, you dirty dog. <laughs> this is a genius way to think about the power of makeup. Oh, it's really, I think it's everything. I think makeup is so profound to me. So I feel you really lucky. You keep saying beauty makeup. Why do you call it beauty makeup? Does that to differentiate from special effects or? Yeah, I think that, yeah, beauty, that's interesting. Beauty makeup is about more about ideas, I think more aspirational and the kind of special effects makeup is more of a storytelling tool. That's what I would say. Yeah. And so, I mean, I first heard about your work because of your book, Beauty of the Beast that you did. And you talk about some of this actually with your surgery, I know in the book, but I'm curious what inspired you to like give away all your secrets. Like I feel like special effects makeup artists are like, that is their trade. Knowing how to do all those crazy things is what gets them work again and again. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Maybe it was irresponsible. No, I didn't mean it like that. I... No, I mean, well, so I was really inspired by this book that I have here, actually. Well, two books, the Bobby Brown, uh, Bobby Brown books I just got for Christmas and it totally blew my mind. I remember, but I found this on eBay. Actually, this is a Dick Smith uh, who won the Oscar for makeup on his work on Amadeus. Do you know that movie? Yeah. yeah. So the Salieri makeup. So, yeah, he so made him they, so sick. Yep, yep. And they made it, yeah, they made him so sick. And then also the Salieri, like, flashbacks where they have Salieri as an old man. So he actually formulated a new kind of wrinkle stipple where he has gelatin. It's gelatin and liquid latex together. And you can do, and that was, it kind of revolutionized special effects. And he, to me, he's really kind of my hero. And in 1965, he made this monster makeup handbook using his son, who was 11 years old at the time, and his friends. And it's all how to do special effects makeup with materials you can find in the grocery store. Wow. Right? So what's, what's cool is that, you know, me growing up as a girl, I get all these, you know, Bobby Brown, how to do a smoky eye for your crush kind of thing, like get rid of your under eye bags. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're like 11 year old boy, you get these like fun, if I can show you, just like, you know, things like this. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's evil. So the idea behind the book is that it's a combination beauty and special effects. And I'm just really, I put so much time into thinking about the structure of the book is probably what took the longest time because I, yeah, I really wanted it to be a cumulative textbook where, yeah, we introduce new skills the whole time. 
And yeah, and it's a, it's blending beauty and special effects, saying that beauty is really just looking alive. Now, I know that you've been asked this before in other interviews about like the special effects world being like very male and everything, like very male dominated. I I've never been in the special effects world, but I've read enough and we've looked for other artists in this world and a lot of them have been guys. What's interesting is that you, you just showed, you picked up the Bobby Brown book and then you picked up this kind of masculine looking image. When you're working on your book and in your world, do you have uh, women like friends, just like how Jen and I are in our world? And then we have a lot of, while we're not artists, we have a lot of contemporaries that we talk to. And a lot of them, there's more men in there for sure than there were when we first started. But like, is your world mostly um, women or men or is it both right now? Like, who do you talk to about all this stuff? You. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just picturing you working on this book. Like, who are you emailing? Who are you showing stuff to? Like, who are you shooting this breeze with, you know? Yeah, well, well, I worked with Claire. Claire Marie Healy was the editor on this book, and she it would not have happened without her. And I also worked with Perrin Drum at A24. And they really, and Zoe Beyer also at A24. And they really believed in the project and, and were very patient with me while I was really trying to figure out what is this kind of like course or like path we're going to take with the book. And Claire is a brilliant writer and she also is not a makeup person. And so it was really helpful to kind of walk through this stuff with her because I wanted this to be a manual that teenagers could use or any budding film. So it was Claire and Claire and I met every week. And yeah, we just hashed it out. Do you have mentees? Like other young women who, I'm saying like female mentees that want to work with you or? Well, there, I have one assistant who's in the book, actually. She's the dead chapter, Nat. Yeah, I put her in the book. She is the only person I really have assist me right now because she really has the touch. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to sometimes have a lot of assistance because I think makeup is so the hand. I mean, it's it's so personal. And yeah, it's really... Yeah, I'm trying to think mentees. I could say who taught me things. No, if we're talking about young people. I think we have to back up here. You just you dropped that you were just on a film set at age 14. Could we just get the story on that oh, before yeah, we that move was, forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so that was funny. That was um yeah, and I do write about this a little bit in the introduction. But it was my my big brother. He's five years older, and we're very close. And he saw me doing this special effects makeup on myself recovering from this surgery and his brother uh his friend his old high school friend bowman who was i was close with also was going to new york film academy and he needed he had a zombie scene it was a zombie apocalypse and my brother was like oh you know my sister's been doing makeup you should hire her so bowman gave me three hundred dollars for this a huge for this budget job. a huge i mean <laughs> for me it was huge obviously i'm 14 and i come with my just beauty makeup kit that I used on myself in the mirror, like, you know, that I was using at school with, with this mascara, with this blush. And he put me in the bathroom. I remember it was off the Franklin one stop. It was in Tribeca. And I, um, go into this bathroom with this nine year old boy and he was like, make him look like he just survived a zombie apocalypse. So I took this little, <laughs> it was a, it was a Bobby Brown. Remember the Bobby Brown liner gel? Yeah. Yeah. They oh, still make yeah. those caviar. Yeah. Caviar, caviar was my is, color. Okay, so I put caviar all over him. <laughs> oh my god, that's <laughs> gonna I, stay. I just smudged it like in my thumbs, and I remember like tracing his ribs, making him, you know, sinking and raising the planes of his body to kind of. And what I was doing was mimicking what I saw in myself when I when my rib was jutting out. You know what I mean? It was I was really taking from my personal experience, and then I remember. Um, the next job with him, after he gave me that money, I bought like a little kit. I had like one of those cute little black boxes with the silver trim. And I got just a Ben Nye regular makeup kit. And then I added, you know, some of my like Vincent Longo sparkly eyeshadows from Sephora, whatever. Yes. Like, yeah, remember, the, remember this? Of and, course. Uh, Vincent Longo is a blast from the past. Right, Thank you for right. that But one. they had those eyeshadows with the dark. The trio, been obsessed- like little pie. That's right. I've always been obsessed with products. I've always been a big product. I was obsessed with dry shampoo in middle school, I remember. I remember I turned to my sister and I was like, this is going to be a huge industry. Like, let's let's watch this go. <laughs> like, I remember. And it was just the pst. Remember that pst brand? Yeah, 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 yeah. There was a place in Riverdale called DJ Drugs, and I would just buy all of the pst. Anyways. Amazing. We, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so 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 I made him a zombie, and then the next time it was at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, and I had to make a whole like floor of people look sick, 
And that was when I really went into my previous up look, thinking about the way I looked after the surgery, and I kind of made everyone sallow and gray and sunk sunk their cheekbones, that kind of thing. And that was an eerie. That was pretty eerie. Being in a hospital like a year and a half after my surgery and like oh, making these yeah. people look sick was pretty. Was this for Bowman's movie also? The same. Yeah, movie? that was another short. I have to ask him if. If he has these shorts, I really want to see them. I don't think I ever saw them. What has been like the most challenging project you've ever done? Uh, okay. I would say it was, I, I worked on this Netflix series called Time and it was the Khalif Browder story. And Khalif Browder, I don't know if you're familiar, but he got solitary confinement in Rikers for stealing a backpack at the age of, I think, 14, like a child. And it's a really horrible story about just him getting caught in the prison system, really, for no reason. And it was a documentary series, but I was doing the recreation. So I was also doing a uh, wardrobe for those. So I had to watch a lot of Rikers footage from 2013. Uh-huh. And they changed all the badges right after. Traumatizing. Yeah, but it was uh, his mother, Vanita, was a really beautiful person. And she was interviewed a lot for it. So that really showed me, I mean, so much of makeup, I think, is shepherding someone into feeling ready to be immortalized. It's like you really are the portal. And I I really think of it that way. It's It's a spiritual kind of zone. It's a ceremony of getting, of preparing somebody for the camera. And that's how I felt with Vanita, making her feel comfortable to tell her story, maybe, maybe making her laugh if I could, even though it's pretty... It was bleak circumstances, but I'll never forget going, getting to go to Macy's with their budget, and Macy's and a couple other places, and getting her a dress that she felt really beautiful in. I'll never forget that. Her trying it on, and I could see her feeling kind of ready. I love the idea of getting a person ready to be immortalized, because that was a documentary, and that was a real person who's having their moment that will live on beyond them in this Netflix series. And telling an important story. I mean, yeah, I think that must have just been a hard product Uh, a really hard project to be even be a part of yeah 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 just being on a set just being a part of that story you're kind of like yeah it weighs heavy but it also felt important it's very important okay that was a real person for you know a documentary series making them feel seen is really important if you're approaching a character work like special effects is do you think about that immortalization thing you just said as well I think of that, I think of more, you're making a sculpture. And what's so gratifying about that is you're making this sculpture, your canvas is breathing. It's like this surface that's like changing in secretion and you're, you're painting. And then what's so amazing is you make this thing and then someone else operates it and then someone else captures it. And that's, I love that collaboration, the collaborative aspect of it to make something and then watch it breathe is really cool. And yeah, watch okay, it. Kind Frankenstein. Of, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, watch it breathe. Yeah, it's going to be good. You're right. Over COVID, I started making puppets, and it is because puppets have, you know, it's kind of special effects and then wardrobe. And it was the same, it's the same feeling I get when I do prosthetics. It's like making this thing, bringing this thing to life, and then watching someone else operate it. It's like really cool. Is there like a character that you want to bring to life that you haven't? I mean, I'm sure you're, there's still so much more in your career. So it's weird to be like, there's still so much in you. There's still so much for you to do, but it's like, oh, I've always wanted to do, I don't know, the beast from Beauty and the Beast, you know, or I yeah. want to work with Disney. I want to do something, uh, Tim Burton, you know. I'll tell you what I want to do. And I hope this doesn't, you can take it out of this is offensive, but it shouldn't be. I would love, I, last year I did Bill Clinton's makeup for a documentary series and I would love to do Trump's makeup because I just only, I just want to know what products he likes. <laughs> I want it cause I bet he's like oh, really he's brand probably very loyal. specific. He has a look. Yeah. Oh, what I is, bet he is like I don't know what's going throat, on there. Cutthroat brand loyal. I mean, there's no way. He's I not. feel like he got stuck on a bronzer from the seventies and mm-hmm. like, but that's his brand. Cause it has that kind of, I remember, I forget the name of it. It was like a, it had like an orangey tint, this bronzer. It was like Cody maybe or something. Mm-hmm. Like glow. 
I don't think Cody wants to be a No, no, but it was like, what, like airspun powder. You know, it had that packaging from the 70s kind of look. And I remember it was like, it was terracotta maybe was the name of it. Yeah, it looks well, like something that's, like that's that. That's Guerlain. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I just want to know what he, I just think it would be very interesting to watch him put on his makeup. Because I don't know if he does it, if he hires somebody, I bet he kind of, I wouldn't be surprised if he does it himself. I don't know. Yeah. Be interesting. Who knows? But okay, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe but we Bill, shouldn't say that. But Bill, Bill, Bill Clinton does not do his own makeup, right? No, he does not. Okay. Where, so where are you getting your inspiration? Like clearly, when you're working on someone like Bill Clinton, or you're immortalizing someone for a documentary, you're making them look their best. But when you're creating a zombie, or you know, you get a script. Mm-hmm. Like where do you start? Well, I read the script, and then I mean the power the power of makeup and hair is that you kind of see how the person in the script relates to everyone else in their life. So are they doing their hair like their best friend? Does their mom cut their hair? I mean, like, really, who are they mimicking? And you see in the hair makeup how they treat themselves. You know, you read the script, you say, like, this is, you know, what people are saying to them. But what are they saying to themselves? And I think you can see that in the hair makeup. How far away from the mirror are they standing when they do their makeup? That's something to think about. It's interesting. Some people are really on top of the mirror. Some people stand like five feet back. Oh, I like a floor length where you can sit and be like right up in there. I love that too. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> yeah. What about something that we've really noticed in the past, really like personally, I've noticed in like the past like decade is how beauty has become more provocative just in general. Like, you know, beauty photography, beauty editorial, even beauty products. You look at somebody like Isamea French. She's one of the top makeup artists now and her line is so successful. It's certainly not CoverGirl, you know, and her her beauty look and aesthetic is, I mean, her her work is so much prosthetics and it almost is like an anti-beauty kind of look sometimes. Not all of her stuff, but a lot of it. Even if you look at Glossier's advertising so much of it, while it's very pretty, a lot of it's like mush. It's like beauty. You see the texture. It's up close. It's almost like pretty gore, you know? And then you look at the runways. It's so much more experimental than it was before. While it's not your world, I see those two things colliding. I mean, we're having you on the podcast and you're not a conventional makeup artist, but we think you're really aspirational. How do you see these two worlds combining today and in the next five years? Where do you see your work overlapping? Do you, could you see yourself having a line? Could you see yourself That's working with dream. brands? The dream? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, I've always been obsessed with I've been pretty, I've been very passionate about products. I'll never forget when I learned that the the founder of Revlon said, we don't sell lipstick, we sell hope. I always thought that was such a beautiful um, idea. And I remember asking my dad what he thinks I should do when I grow up. And he said that I need to define the modern woman and I need to show him who the modern woman is. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that that's always been what I think about. But we'll draw that connection for me back to like you're making people look sick because I see it, but I think there's still any, like it needs to be like clearer. Right. Sorry. I feel like we're like doing a brand deck No for pressure. You. <laughs> no, I love this. I'm so happy to talk to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, how can we sell it? No, because I think, <laughs> I think it's interesting. You know, that whole biomech vibe that mm-hmm. like, Okay. So Isamea does a bit of that. It's almost like the insides of the, you were talking about skin, like the blush. Okay, blush, right? Mm. Blush, you think of blush, you said you don't think of it as like a thing you put on your cheek. You think of it as like like life force, like blood, right? It's blood. So yes, so absolutely. So it is for me all about blood. To be honest, I think that that's true. I think that like blood, you're just mimicking, you know, of like life force rushing underneath your face. I think a lot of the time you're mimicking post-coitus like you do kind of want to look like to me beauty makeup when I say alive I really mean like you just orgasmed and that's I mean it makes sense with NARS with their orgasm blood yeah long eyelashes it's like it's health long eyebrows is health shiny dewy complexion like I think a lot of beauty can be traced back to just biology bio beauty Full hair, you know, yeah, bio beauty. <laughs> this is, right. This is this is all the stuff that sadly starts to kind of like 
figure out, you know, as time goes <laughs> on. That's, that's why everyone wants it. Yeah. It's true. But I also think, yeah, I, I mean, with all the... Oh, you mean with age? I was like, wait, what do you mean? But you mean like all that, yeah, that it's flush like, of it's, youth? Yeah. And I think it's funny because like it's the anti-aging thing and not to, I don't want to segue too hard this way, but it's like people really freak out about like that anti-aging embrace your age thing. But I think it's people, I think just, they want that kind of vitality back. I think it's a natural thing. It's a, it's a really hard thing to kind of stamp out. That's why I think the post-coitus thing is funny. Cause it's kind of like, you can be whatever age you want, but as long as you're fucking kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you're still alive. like as long as you're like alive and i think that's what blush is blush is like i just whatever <laughs> so it's like well, you can be however old 55 and you're, right you're still like engaged and you're still using your body and feeling good that's that's anti-aging you know what i mean it's not using your body and feeling good yeah it's like not that. it's not like you know preserving embalming yourself no it's living your life and yeah, if that makes sense. Maybe I can think say that in a better way. Uh, but I do think of embalming a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, how so? Just with all the a lot of anti aging stuff that's going on, I think about that you're kind of embalming yourself, and you could limit your expression too much. You can do all these things, and everyone looking the same. I think that's like seeing like the expression and waxy, waxy, and you all end up kind of. I, I think a lot about like Kylie Jenner and Madonna for a second looked the same age. Maybe I should, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying that, but they did. I was kind of like, oh, these two people could be the exact same age. They're just kind of. Oh, or Christina Aguilera. Everybody's been talking about how like a picture of her now and a picture from when she was teen. Is that the same person? And that's weird. It's hard. It's like, it's like aging like a rose. Rose is, I, I think about the image of like a rose kind of unfolding throughout time and how beautiful that is and a rose bud. And it's a different kind of beauty and you can't turn a rose into a rose bud. It looks kind of, but to, but then you've got to enjoy the rose. I sound like such a, a no, pervert. It's okay. <laughs> no, that makes sense. no you, you don't sound like a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i i don't mean to make this like like it's the halloween time room spooky and like the way you're talking about makeup i'm like this is so beyond gore and special effects the way i've thought about it in the past so i love that you're changing the way i'm thinking about it but i do want to talk about the idea of horror and being scared and you as someone who creates this like when you're making a zombie, like, do you have that fear still when you watch the movies or when you're even, cre you make someone and they look creepy? Are you f creeped out by them? Interesting. I think, well, I will say that makeup, especially for film, is something that you never want to notice the makeup. You never, for me, you never want to say, oh, the makeup was so good because then the movie is probably bad. Like, I feel like you want to say, oh, I was so into it. Like, I was just in the world and that's it. To me, makeup right. is, that's good. To me, makeup is the last detail. And you just don't want to, the, the goal with makeup is just to not take someone out of the scene. That's why even just for an, in, something as simple as an interview for a documentary, you don't want them to be shiny. You don't want to be thinking about how greasy their face is. You want to focus on what they're saying. So I think that that's kind of what makeup is. The best makeup is unnoticed. The best makeup you're just thinking about, yeah, how scared you are in the movie. Right. You're not like, what a great job. Like, that's a great scene, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I wonder if that's, you know, foam latex or silicone or whatever. You don't want to be thinking about that. You want to just be, like, freaked out. Are there other people's work that impresses you? Like, how did they do that? Other special effects artists? I think Isamaya is pretty amazing. I, I, I'm aligned with her, I think. I really love her work. But we've been working, yeah, in the same world for a long time, too. Yeah. But I'm always inspired by what I see her do. Who else? I don't know, man. I feel like I get my most inspiration from the subway. Like, I feel like just riding the subway and looking at people kind of... What I love to do is when people come into my makeup chair, because makeup is all about first impressions also, right? So mm -hmm. I like when someone comes in, an actor, I like to imagine who they are. Be like, okay, I wonder if they're like this. And then when they're in the chair, I ask them questions about themselves. And it's kind of like a little test. For me, like how good am I at figuring out these like surface markers and how they indicate, you know, how the person lives their life. Are you good? Yeah, I'm getting better, better every day. I feel the more I do it, the more I do it, the better it is. 
Wait, give us an example. Like someone will sit down. What will you see that will then inspire how you're going to take the look? Well, the whole, like, how far away from the makeup do you, from the mirror do you do your makeup thing? I definitely ask people that. It doesn't make it better or worse the farther you are away. It just makes it different. It's, it's cool. It's, it makes it more like bigger shapes, bigger shadows on the okay. face. Well, this is when you're enhancing that person. I'm thinking about, I saw your work on the cover of New York Magazine this summer. You turned humans into animals. That was so fun. That was a really fun tough shoot. Tell us about that project. You're not just rubbing some caviar Bobby Brown on the ribs. Like <laughs> yeah. you made them into cats and fish. Oh, that was so fun. Well, I work with RBFX, which is a Robert Berman FX in LA. They have really amazing molds of prosthetic, pre-made prosthetics. So I can do jobs on a short notice that way. And then it be kind of kind of becomes styling because you're perusing the website and you can kind of pick like, oh, I want this nose, these ears. But it's not colored, right? Like you still have to put makeup oh, no, on yeah, top of it. Yeah, you have to it. paint and you have to kind of figure, like with the bloat, with the fish, for example, the fish was probably my favorite one. And the fish I ended up using, you're just on the spot. It's always different. I mean, that's what makes this job fun is that it's, it's a constant, you're constantly solving problems. And I put a bald cap. He had kind of, just to have the skin texture uniform throughout the head, I put a bald cap on the top of his head and then I put a bald cap on the bottom of his head too. That was a big breakthrough to base all of the prosthetics on to have a uniform texture. That was something I wasn't planning on doing that I did. Wait, does this involve a neck bladder? I got very intrigued by neck bladders from your This body. did not, know this, but the neck bladder. Tell that's us what fine. a neck bladder is. I think I'm going to fucking vomit. Excuse my <laughs> language. <laughs> I don't know a if we need to bladder. hear it. <laughs> it's just the name of it. But this, I want people to understand like how technical your work can get. It's artistry, but there's also a craftsman aspect. It's, it. it's anatomy. Yeah, what's a neck bladder? What's going on there? Bladder, How do you use those? It's a, well, the way you do it is you take a balloon animal, like the, a kind of balloon you'd use for a balloon animal. And you embed it in the skin. You'll make kind of like one layer of liquid latex and then you lay it on top and then you cut little slits in it. So then when you apply it to the neck, you attach a, a pressure of pesticide sprayer that you can get at like Home Depot. You can use a bike pump. It really depends where they're shooting. I mean, if, if you can be in frame, if you can be crouching kind of at the feet of the actor or if they have to run freely into frame, you use a bike pump. But it's easier and you get a better flow if you're close by and there's not so much tubing for the fake blood to go through or goo or whatever. She buried it the is. lead there, the fake blood. That's so we can make it look like our neck got cut, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Pumping out. Yeah, All right, we're good. sorry. We it's get, for get, projectile get blood this spray. Is, this is why we have the expert here. These are the questions I've always wanted to ask that I'm just like, how do they do that? Which I know you get into in your book, but for our podcast sake. Well, I don't talk about how, like, it depends how you cut the, the balloon. You know, if you do, like, a couple little dots, it'll trickle differently. Like, it's all kind of figuring out. So you have to get into the mind of the killer, not just the Oh, my God, victim. I hate this stuff so much. Well, that's right. No, it's true. Is, is, the, is the killer left-handed or right-handed? How long were they there? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of, like, uh... Yeah. It's like forensics okay. or something. Okay, but we can move on. <laughs> yeah, it's too no, much. This is- What's journalism? I'm I know. It's I think like, people are people are intrigued. I know people are intrigued by this. I know people love horror movies. Like, do you like horror movies? Emily? I do like horror movies. What's your favorite? Ooh, I just watched Daughters of Darkness, which I love. Do you know that one? No, I'm I'm too scared to watch horror movies, to be perfectly honest. Oh man. We were asking good. about I'm, a freaking neck bladder. Well, this is part of my reasoning that I wanted to speak with Emily, besides I'm such a fan of your work. I was just like, maybe this will take away that fantastical aspect and let me see it like and not be scared by it. But does that happen to you knowing what all goes into it? Can you watch things and are you thinking like, oh, I use the wrong size bladder and tubing? Or are you still caught up in you know what I mean? It depends how good the movie is. <laughs> It's like you said about it. If it's good work, I shouldn't be thinking about that. Yeah, if it's good work, I'm like, I'm just, you know, in awe of the whole team. But I will say Daughters of Darkness, this kind of ties to Halloween. Right. Daughters of Darkness is cool. It's kind of like a very stylized kind of lesbian vampire movie. And it's the the main vampire. She always has these perfect red lips and these long red nails. And it really is kind of like she's on the hunt. Like it does kind of look like... She has blood on her lips and blood on her nails, but it's it's so perfectly done that I think that that's why I like that movie so much. I just kept mm. thinking about like, woof, this is like a real combination. This is like blood beauty. It's very stylized. Mm-hmm. 
lips and tips. We'll keep this on the mood board for your eventual line, maybe. Yeah. What are some of your favorite traditional makeup products to use at work? You've, we've mentioned this eyeliner. It's, is there any basics in your kit or is it all like latex and powders oh, no. and gels? Yeah, let me think. Basics. I actually have my kit right here. I could look. I mean, I love, NARS has this product that I love so much, which is the luminizing primer. They just made the package differently, but I don't really do a job without that product. Who do you use it on? Pretty much any skin that will be on camera, I like to use that on. It just really, oh, I'll say one, one more thing with the book. One other combination is I wanted to combine film makeup and real life makeup because now, I mean, what we're doing right now, we're on film, but this is real life. So I think that there is room and beauty to go more to into into the reality of just being on camera all the time. I would use this. Yeah, I use this. For, I love Embryolisse. Obviously, that's like a makeup artist standard. Mm -hmm. But I end up using that on myself all the time. Why is everyone getting the NARS Luminizer? I just love how it makes skin look. It's, it makes skin look very buttery on camera. If you If you combine that with a little bit of concealer and a little bit of sculpting, it's just really Wait, what's glowy. sculpting? Sculpting like using... Yeah, what do you sculpt with? I'll take the foundation color and then I'll mix in a little bit of gray or something like that. Or I'll use... I love the Kevin O'Coin sculpting powders. And I'll just, you know, it's, it's contouring, but I, I do think of it as sculpting where you're just kind of taking the shadows of the face and sinking them slightly. Because I think that the goal for on-screen makeup is to make your features look as big as possible, take up as much of your face as possible, your expression. So you do kind of want to get rid of that perimeter. Yes, for beauty reasons, but also for reasons of expression. What's your favorite mascara? L'Oreal Voluminous. You know that one? Yeah. I love that one. What about liner? I love the Makeup Forever Aqua. You know, that they come in... Oh, no, no. I've been using Danessa Myricks, actually. I love Danessa Myricks' line. Yeah, she has these little tubes. The multi-purpose ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a bunch of those in my kit. They also don't leak, but they last forever. And that, yeah, that's my favorite liner. Okay, so Halloween is what? next week. I'm one of these, it's like, I don't really do Halloween. I know people are listening, like, no. my kid's going to do Halloween. I got to do something with, out of nothing. Like, it's you. Tomorrow's Halloween. You have no costume. What can you throw together from your makeup bag? Well, it's a little bit of a trick question because I'm the same thing for Halloween every year. <laughs> <laughs> she took it literally. Okay. What are you every year? I'm, I am George Washington. I've been George Washington for the past six years for Halloween. What? I just have... What's, what is it with George Washington? Is this just like the only thing in your house or you really like George Washington? I just think it's really funny. He's number one. It's like just the, the first president of the United States. It's very straightforward. She's got the wig. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of just... How, is that wig still in shape? If I had that wig lying in my house year after year, I've got to tell you, I don't think it would look like right after the third year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's looked better. It's looked better. It's true. I've been, I've, I take care of it a little bit. Maybe you should run to Target and pick up something <laughs> new, something fresh. They've got a lot of great costumes there. Okay, but what, but what would I do? Anything. Uh, a cat? A what bat? What would I do? No, no, it's a great question. Cat's, well, a, cat's a classic last-minute costume. Throw a little eyeliner whisker on. Yeah, let <laughs> I me know. think. Let me think. This is a great Harry question. Potter? I don't know. There's so many, like, <laughs> easy costumes. Well, I, I also personally can't do, I'm allergic to adhesive. I'm actually, that's why I've never done prosthetics on myself is because I break out in hives. So I'm a little bit envious of Isamaya that she can do all the prosthetics on herself because I could never do it. I just get a rash. And let me think, what would I, what would I be? I'd probably Groucho be marks, like, like dead a million something. Things. I would probably be like dead something like you want it if oh. you have an outfit dead like, taylor dead swift mail, oh my God. you know what i mean yeah sure dead yeah i mean i was just picturing the like most like a famous person that everybody would you know, know who that was i yeah. probably do that i think that's like very <laughs> did funny. you say dead milkman yeah mailman <laughs> sorry let's go with yours yours is better no i'm like if you have like just a regular you know run of the mill man mailman outfit whatever you put it on and then you're then you do a little you know dark circles a little pale and you're dead i think that's funny <laughs> so I can be dead Jen. So if I really don't even have the male like, postal worker dead. outfit, it's just me, but dead, guys. 
<laughs> risen from the dead. That's good. The grayness, the Honestly, pallor. I get that's it. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, okay, if, I, if you give me one day, I don't have my beloved that's, George Washington no, you, costume. I would probably came up, just came, be, yeah. We've just inspired people. Do you have there like, you do you walk around with like an like the axe, like a cherry tree? Do you have any like accessories? Just no, but I thought you could I tell I hate this costume. <laughs> I know, I can tell. <laughs> I, like, fucking hate this I don't know why. It's like, it's not like I don't like George Washington. I just like, I don't know. It just doesn't. It feels like Fourth of July. Your, it's so Or funny. President's Day. You're right. It's just, it's You're not right. giving Halloween. It's not like a friendly go. You know what? It goes Let back me. to elementary school. Like every month was a different vibe on the bulletin board. And yeah. this mm-hmm. is the February vibe, but You're right. it's October. You're right. Yeah, I mean, I okay, well, why going. I like it, why I like it, I think that what makes a really good costume, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I think actually makes the best costume, is you need a line. So you need, like, one, like, tagline. So people say, you know, oh, who are you? And you go, I'm George Washington. And then you say, number one. You know what I'm saying? Like, you kind of okay, need, yeah, like, a yeah. little <laughs> follow-up. You have to be All like, right, oh, okay, uh, All right. number one. And I actually read, I read this, Ron Chernow has a George Washington biography that I read recently. And can I tell you, <laughs> one, can I tell you one story from it, which is really yeah, yeah, kind yes, of blew yeah. my mind. So people don't know this about him, but he was physically very impressive. He was really tall, and apparently he was a beautiful dancer and really beautiful on horseback, could throw a ball farther than anyone else with ease. You know, he would make it look easy. So that's the thing about George, that, that we don't know. We wouldn't know that. You know what I mean? He's the and number one guy. He's one. And he had a really big seat. So he had like a fat ass, basically. And he would have all of his clothing made custom in England so he can, you know, compete with all the guys, whatever. And so he would send his measurements over and the tailor would correct them because he was like, no way this is real. Like he can't, his ass can't be this fat basically. And he took, and they would send back these britches and they'd be too tight on George Washington. And he would write, and the letters back and forth are so funny because it's just like, you need to follow my measurements perfectly. And I've had these situations where, you know, if I've styled someone where I look at their measurements, I'm like, no way, but it's real. So I just love imagining that. That, that correspondence between of him being pissed off, like trying on these britches, they're too tight on his ass, and being like, oh, he didn't follow my measurements, you know? And then, one step further, I like to think about how he's on the $1 bill, right. and I like to think about, like, strip clubs. This is me maybe going too far, but I love imagining, like, these women dancing, and then you put the, the George Washington. Nobody wants George. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, I just think he's poignant. I don't think I'm not like a huge you, fan of the founding no, fathers no, at all, and I don't so, want to come off that way. Especially poignant, stuck in a g-string it's just of a dancer. Fun, yeah, it's just yeah. to me, it's very no, American. I, I'm like, this is. I see him in a totally new light now. <laughs> don't dust that I thing off. Put it on. That you double down and Jess didn't like it, and you're like, I'm gonna make you like it. I'm gonna make you like I George Washington. I never knew this. Much. He was sick. I've never. Yeah. Yeah. Guess what Jess is being for Halloween this year? Martha. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. Let's do a fat mascara five, shall we? Yeah. Okay, this is our speed round. Jess, take it away. Okay. Okay. I'm laughing so hard. All right. What was the first beauty product you ever fell in love with? And I feel like I'm excited to hear your answer. Oh, my God. Okay. I was in fourth grade. Ever since you dropped Vincent Longo, I'm like, oh, she's got a good one. (laughs) I was in fourth grade. Well, this was my first beauty product ever. And it was the Great Lash Clear Eyebrow Setting thing. (laughs) And in fourth grade, I would wear it on my eyelashes as mascara. Oh, okay. Bad Isn't that cute? Club? I know. That was, that's what I, I would just Fourth like grade. Gel, gel my eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. But then I can think of other products, though. I do love eyelashes. No, that's, well, that's good. That's the answer. Okay. That's, that's the good. Answer. Okay, that's my answer. What's your favorite movie? It's kind of hard. Amadeus. <laughs> Amadeus. Oh, God, yes. That's it. Amadeus. Yeah, it, the combination of Dick Smith's makeup on Salieri, but also like the 80s take on so good that that the, era the soundtrack Vienna, so good the soundtrack so good yeah i just really i i watched that movie growing up maybe Wait, like guys, weekly 
correct me if I'm because I love the movies. Amadeus, Amadeus, uh, yeah. Amadeus. Mm-hmm. That was from that movie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just was it? Yeah, that was in the movie. Like, the, was it made for the movie? I think it was made in the movie. It was remember. made for the movie. I won't, I can't be quoted on that. Wait, oh. Hold on. Sorry. We're doing real time fact checking. Hold on. Did the earbud? Yeah, wait, she's got hold on. I have it. Okay. But yeah, I love Milos Forman so much. He's one of my favorite directors. And, and that maybe movie what, is, the, the movie, the movie, hold on. Wait, no, I don't think it was made for the movie. The soundtrack is all like classical. Maybe. Mm-hmm. I think so. Well, yeah, I feel Mozart's like it's music, but I remember having a modern twist. Like I remember there being rock in it. Like when you say, but there death. was, was it's Falco, right? Remember it was Falco, rock me Amadeus. Okay. So was that like a theme song? I feel like it was because it was the same time. We should definitely use our podcast and our listeners time to figure this out. Absolutely. We, we should. I mean, if, if, but you know, regardless of whether or not it was in the movie, it inspired, maybe it inspired that it was song, around, which is and the I power remember of cinema. The song was inspired yeah. by the movie Amadeus. Is oh, that true? really? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you fucking go. And, that's, to okay, and I will say that's one thing that I love about working in film is that it's not like trend prediction, but you can really kind of see where things are going. You know what I mean? And, and put, and if you put it in a movie, then it, it goes there. Like Barbie Copter. summer last summer. Like that's yeah. like that. Yeah, but, but that I'm movie was so cool. lush, yeah. and the acting was so good. But you can kind of start trends that you want to see sometimes. Yeah. All right. Third question in our Fat Mascara Five Speed Round: Who is your fantasy interview subject or dinner date? Anyone who you just want to hang out and chat with? They don't need to be alive. I mean, Dick Smith. I think we knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah probably Dick Smith. I'd want to talk oh, to. We him. want that for you. That'd be amazing. Uh, he's gone though. You know what he did in this book is he put his home phone number. He worked out of his basement in Larchmont and a lot of special wow. effects people that I've, that I've, that have mentored me that I've spoken to started working in special effects because they were a teenager that called Dick Smith up in his basement. This book is from the 60s. That's so cool. Yeah, 1965. Said, and he just put his like probably just seven digits at the time, right? <laughs> probably. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And a lot of That's people so cool. got their starts from special effects just by calling him up. I, so love I imagine that. he would just be really generous. And I think that that was a lot of the idea behind this book was kind of, I think the most, the people I admire the most give it away and have confidence that it's not. Yeah. You can tell anyone how to do something, but it's you that you're the one that makes the decisions to make it special. So I think that you should give everyone the tools. That's beautiful. I like the way you said that. What is your favorite snack? Right now I'm on a red bell pepper kick. I love eating red bell peppers. This is a thing that give me a lot of energy. Healthy. What else? I, I make chicken soup all the time. I have like a chicken soup that I make with chicken feet uh, and things like that. And I do feel like it's kind of special effects cooking. I'm like this. I'm going to make this gross thing delicious and good Get for me. A cauldron. Yeah. A dry ice thrown in. <laughs> I make liver and onions a lot. Yeah. I like those. Too. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Jess, you look so disturbed. You're like, Ooh. Which is a vegetarian, so understand. Okay, yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, last question. So I should have left it at red bell pepper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you keep those chicken feet. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, if, it, if, it's, um, <laughs> if it's 11 a.m. on your day off, what are you doing? I'm probably putzing around my studio, maybe calling somebody. I love to talk on the phone. That's my favorite medium. I'm not very good at text or email, but my fa- I love talking on the phone. Who do you like to talk to? I'm just friends. This podcast reminds me of like when I had a curly phone cord and I'd call up my friends in middle school and just do that. Like the whole chat we just had felt very like just girls on the phone. Just girls. Wait, Emily, (laughs) Emily, 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 do you, do you find that there, I have friends. It's not that they've said, don't call me. (laughs) (laughs) no it sounds like a funny funny like we're going somewhere weird i have friends that are like phone friends and then friends who i feel like have slowly like they're not phone people like they've become like they've gone with the times and they're more texters right and then i have friends who are like phoners do you have the phoners and the non-phoners the non-phoners have decided that I'm flaky. I think <laughs> like the people that are just on text are like, Emily hasn't responded to me and whatever, you know, but, but they don't know is they should just. Because you don't text because you're, you're not a texter. 
I'm just not good at tech. I like to be, I feel like I being fully present. It's hard to be fully present when you're texting all the time. And that's why I like the phone is because you are just totally, you're with somebody and you're talking, you know, I love that part. And I think it is on set. You get that too on set. It's like full on. Yeah. I think I, I don't, I'm not very good at remote stuff. I get you. Yeah. I think I like the hands on. You're good at this. Well, thank you. I, well, that's thank you, you for being are, present. You guys are yeah. making me feel comfortable and excited. Sorry, I laughed at your Halloween costume. <laughs> it's the apology portion of the podcast. <laughs> Sorry, we laughed at your costume, Emily. <laughs> there's so much now. Now I'm thinking there's so much I want to tell you guys, or I want I want to talk about. This is so fun. Oh, it's all right. I feel Do like, you have any you more know, questions? Um, I mean, yeah, a lot. But. Yeah, but usually we do the Fat Mascara <laughs> 5 as, like, our last thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. But now I feel bad. Now I just want you to stick around. No, no, but no. I think, I'm just you know, we gotta edit you can invite us. So, you can invite us over for some bean soup one day. <laughs> yeah. Some bell peppers. When you said that guy put his phone number in the book, I was like, I was going to make a joke. I like, think oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. We'll put no, your phone it's, number it in the show notes. It just calls back to a different time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So nice. And it does make this you is... think about like, yeah, tools. And a I mean, AI is an interesting thing to think about. Actually, the, the photographer of the New York Magazine covers ha- just came out with an essay on AI. He was a very interesting person. Oh, I and I know that. they wanted to do it in AI, but I think he argued for it being uh, practical, which I'm so grateful for. Smart. Yeah, really smart. It thing. just feels different. It feels visceral. It felt real. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the thing, yeah, with, but, but, but it is, I mean, you could equate like my giving away secrets, whatever to, yeah, you could do this all in AI. You can do, you know what I mean? You, you have the tools to do anything you want. It's just, how do you do it? And that's, yeah. that's what makes it your work. Yeah. The Emily touch. Well, we appreciate you sharing. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. 